Gratitude and Greatness is a production of Recursive Delete Audiovisual. Hi, this is Sarah. Ever since we released this podcast, we've been hearing from people who so appreciate the conversations we're sharing and are wanting something more. I've partnered with one of the loveliest people I know, health coach Erin Vanderkoy, and we will be facilitating a retreat at the Oregon coast called Pause, Breathe, Restore. If you're interested in exploring your grief in a safe, caring, and beautiful environment, please check out pausebreatherestore.com or visit the show notes for this episode. We'd love to have you join us. Grief, Gratitude, and Greatness explores assisting those in grief, the gratitude that keeps us connected, and the greatness we achieve in helping our community heal. I'm your host, Sarah Shaul. The unexpected death of a loved one is tragic, but when a family member disappears without explanation, grief can be different, weird, and confusing. When I heard about Rizal's story, I was compelled to learn more about his unusual experience. I was living in Oklahoma as a little kid. I had a pretty idyllic childhood for a little while there, living out kind of in the middle of nowhere around Oklahoma City and had a mom and a dad and had a couple sisters who were my mother's daughters from previous marriages. It was pretty great for a while there did fun things and hung out with my mom a lot. And she did funny little things. Like I remember once she got me a pet goat and its name was Dragon. And (laughs) she painted these signs because my mother was an artist. She painted these signs that said like, welcome to Sherwood Forest, beware of Dragon and made this little cage for it. And, you know, she, she was a very creative person and she made my childhood a lot of fun in a lot of ways. And then I remember her telling me that Dragon had flown wings and flew away. And then I realized like years later, it was probably just really expensive to feed a goat just as like a thing for a kid to have. And then, yeah, in terms of my childhood, they have horned toads in Oklahoma. I remember my grandmother, who I lived with also at the time because we lived with my grandparents, telling me to be careful because horned toads, when you pick them up, shoot blood out of their eyes, which is like (laughs) exactly the thing you tell a kid if you want him to pick up horned toads. (laughs) So in a lot of ways, had a really nice childhood and, you know, had a couple of sisters to play with and hang around with. And they picked on me a lot and it was fun. And I was really into breakdancing, which was funny because I was like the only kid in Choctaw, Oklahoma, who was into breakdancing. But I think it's because I had seen MTV. So you lived a really rural. Yeah, like a fun, creative, rural life. Yeah. And then my parents split up. They got a separation. Like, I remember watching my mom have a nervous breakdown when I was a little kid, which was really hard. And then one day when I was five years old, she dropped us off at the sitter's house and uh, no one ever saw her again. And so at that point, because my sisters had different fathers and because we lived with my mother's parents, because my dad and my mother were getting a separation, I went to live with my dad. My sisters went to live with their respective fathers. And I basically, my whole world shifted at that point. At five years old? At five, yeah. A couple Mm -hmm. months shy of my sixth birthday. At that point, I was trying to make sense of what had happened. There's, I really don't think much sense to be made from it at that age. It's really just a, a very strange, bizarre mystery. And it's interesting because I have a lot of sisters, all half sisters, half siblings, things like that. And Meredith was my father's daughter from his first marriage before my mother. And I really, at the age of 10, I barely knew that Meredith existed. I actually, at that point, had the feeling like I had lost a lot of sisters because my sisters went to live with their fathers. And also because when I was eight, my father had a daughter with another woman and they gave her up for adoption. So there was also a sense of Mm. loss of that sister. That sister actually ended up finding me a few years ago, which has been really amazing. But when I was 10, my sister Meredith, my father's daughter, came to live with us. It was amazing. Out of nowhere, 
this new sister arrives and she's not a new sister. She's older than me. She's, she was 15 at the time. She was kind of rebellious. She really loved music and I loved music. You know, this was like 1988 and I was really into, you know, Public Enemy and the Beastie Boys and Salt and Peppa. And she was into like Def Leppard and all these bands that I pretended to like, and then eventually actually grew to kind of like. I remember the first night she spent with us. I was pretty overwhelmed with excitement that this new sister showed up. I wanted to sleep in the same room as her because I was just so excited. I was like, <laughs> you know, just so excited. And she was like, you can sleep in the same room. Like we slept like in the living room. Like this, like I wanted a slumber party. Yeah. And so the first night we ever hung out, she said, we can sleep in the same room. But one thing you have to know is that I sleepwalk. And I said, what is sleepwalking? And she said, well, it's when I get up and I walk around, but I'm still asleep. And if you wake me up, it can be really bad. And I remember it was like this whole new level of mystery to this already mysterious person. Yeah. I remember that night just laying on the couch and her laying on this other couch across the room, not sleeping, just kind of staring at her all night and just thinking, wow, like I've got this new sister. So that was interesting. Like I said, she was kind of like a rebellious weirdo in the most wonderful way. She was kind of like I turned out to be. She wasn't crazy about following other people's rules unless they made really good sense to her, which I think at 15, a lot of people's rules don't make sense to you. So we had a good six months living together. Then Valentine's Day, 1988, she disappeared and was never seen or heard from again. And then after that, a year later, two years later, my relationship with my father became very contentious, very abusive in a lot of ways. And I ended up at that point moving around a lot as a teenager, which sort of culminated with me moving to San Francisco when I was 16. There's a lot of other details I could go into, but in terms of sorts of loss that I experienced early on, that's the broad strokes. What about your other siblings? Are you in touch with any of them? Yeah. I mean, aside from Meredith, who disappeared, um, I'm in touch with all my siblings. You know, everyone has the kinds of relationships that they have, but I don't have anything near what I would describe as a normal relationship with any of my siblings, especially the thing with my mom disappearing. I think it just created this sort of like turmoil mm -hmm. and this mystery, you know, like I've had people in my life die. Yeah. And there's a big difference between when someone in your life dies and when someone in your life just disappears. Yes. In terms of my relationships with my siblings, for example, I watched this show recently about this cursed family and I could really relate to it because sometimes when something that mysterious happens to you when you're little or, like, or whenever, it feels like a bit of a curse that just lingers for a long time. It takes a lot for a relationship to recover from that sort of rift. So I'm wondering... How have you come to accept their absences? I really like cling to those memories around that time that my mother disappeared. Not as much so as when my sister disappeared. I couldn't believe it <laughs> when my sister disappeared. I think it was almost too much for me. Yeah. So there's not many memories from that time. Sure. But when my mother disappeared, I think that there was a connection trying to be made across time and space between my mother and me. And I think that I was really receptive to it. I remember going around my house in Oklahoma when I was five. I think it was like a couple weeks after my mother disappeared and getting every photograph I could and trying to line them up in a way that made sense to me. I remember the room. Like I just, I remember it so well. And looking back, it seems like I was making up a ritual. I was making up some kind of ritual to be receptive to holding on to her, to holding on to that time and place. And so I think that's an interesting way that I received that reality, that, that new part of my reality. Does a five-year-old really understand what that is for a parent to disappear? Because at some point she's going to show up, right? Like, when did it really hit you? Sometimes I think in certain ways, it didn't really hit me until I was in my 30s. I remember I was in my studio and I was getting all these paintings ready to hang this show. It was a beautiful day, like a beautiful summer day, and I had the garage door open in my studio and it was a great moment. I guess I was 31 or 32 when this happened. So 25, 26 years later after my mother disappeared, but my mother being an artist as well, me making art has always been a way of communing with her. 
And I remember having this moment of thinking, man, my mother would love this. And it being this bittersweet moment of she would love this, she is going to miss this, but she's also here with me. Asking myself, when did I realize that she was never coming back is really hard because while I know she's gone, I know she's legally dead, etc. I also know that every time I like sit, get in the right frame of mind and put pen to paper or brush to canvas or whatever, that she's right there with me. I'm not certain that a child of that age can actually conceive of a parent not coming back. Right. Over time, your interpretation of her absence must have evolved. Absolutely. And I think it's still evolving. I think I was in survival mode a lot as a kid, looking back, especially after my mother disappeared. It's hard for me to say for sure, but I think someone told me that they felt she wasn't coming back. Mm. I think I think I have a memory of my father actually telling me that he didn't think she was coming back. I think I realized it. Yeah. I think that has a lot to do with intuition. People who have a hard time listening to their intuition, I've never really been able to relate to that because I think from a very early age, I needed to listen to my intuition. And I think that's kind of tied up in what we're talking about. And so your intuition kept you in survival mode and your intuition told you when it was time to leave your dad's house. Yeah. And, and when you were in an age where you could do something. Was there anybody in San Francisco? I mean, wh um, why San Francisco? Jack Kerouac's ghost was oh. in San Francisco. <laughs> I read that book on the road when I was a teenager, and it was just the right book. There was a girl, too, who had moved out there to live with her mom. I liked her, and but really it was that book that really I was like, whoa, San Francisco sounds cool. Like, it looks cool. It's beautiful. It's not like Oklahoma at all. <laughs> it was the opposite of Oklahoma, and I think that's what I needed. And was it? I'm sure you were surprised on some level. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. You know, I bounced back and forth over the next few years between Oklahoma and San Francisco because I had friends who were so wonderful and I had friends' parents who wanted to take care of me and help me finish high school and stuff like that. Yeah, San Francisco was great. You know, San Francisco in the early 90s was like a different world to me. It was fun. It was weird. I'm, I'm really grateful to myself at age 16 for doing that. You know, I think that sometimes younger versions of ourselves do things that the older versions of ourselves won't be able to appreciate until much later on. And I feel like that was one of those things. Are you all on the same page with accepting what may have happened with your mom? I mean, you were so young. I mean, at what point might you have even, like, engaged the authorities and said, hey, what is the answer here? I think that how we feel about what happened to our mother is something that says a lot about where we're at in our lives and in our ideologies now as grown-ups. I didn't see it, but somebody told me that they saw an episode of the Oprah Winfrey show and that it was about people who have, I don't really like this phrase, but lost people to disappearance. I don't think they're really lost. I think they're taken from us during disappearance people who survived the disappearance of loved ones. I heard that there was a whole show dedicated to the frustrations of trying to work with law enforcement around that. And I have experienced that for sure. I tried in my 20s talking to the police in Oklahoma City, asking them if I could come look at the files, things like that, being shut down, you know, having them be rude to me, etc. It's been a bit of a source of conflict between me and one of my siblings because she wants that avenue explored, and that's just not where I can put my energy. And that's because you tried and you've just thought this is a dead end. Yeah, that's one area of my life where I'm not prepared to tolerate authoritarian discourse. <laughs> you know, I'm not prepared to have anybody in a position of authority be disrespectful to me about that because I don't deserve it. Right. I was listening to a conversation that you had with another guest. This idea came up of like, how much of your story do you share? When are you protecting people around your story and things like that? And it's interesting to me because I know I do that. I know that when I talk about my story, I feel the need to comfort and protect people who are listening to the story. Part of the reason for that is that I sometimes feel shame around not doing everything in my power to find out what happened to my mom and my sister. And that's a theme with the people involved in the story as well. Yeah. I think that we share, in addition to a sense of grief, a sense of shame, because we wish there was more that we could do to uncover the truth. Yeah. I think that if this happened now, 
it would be very different than the fact that it happened in the 80s because now it would be all over the internet. But at the time, it was almost to the public. It didn't happen. It wasn't the same kind of world in terms of it's going to be on the news, it's going to be on blast. So I think that that's another thing in terms of how I relate to my siblings, for example, is that we have a guilt and a shame that we don't necessarily deserve, but that's there. We share that. And do you guys talk about that? We do some. Unfortunately, like so many people in the world, our conversations have been replaced by like screen conversations, which I think are just so inefficient and and so sloppy. But we have talked about it some. I think it's definitely something that people who share that kind of trauma and that kind of grief should do more in person if they can, even if it takes decades. You know, like one of my mantras lately has been, Uh, The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Like, that's the kind of thing that I want to do more of. Roselle continues to cultivate his own love of art and music, keeping him close to those taken from him. I feel in my mother's last moments that she willed a good deal of the power that was left in her, her life force to me and that I inherited it in her creativity And I feel like I have a responsibility to her to do good things with that and that I feel like she's very present with me. I feel the same way with my sister to a different extent because my sister was very young when she disappeared. I think she hadn't quite got her powers up to the level that she should have and could have had she been granted more time here and hadn't been taken from us. And I remember telling my friend that and uh, him saying that he was getting goosebumps hearing that and that he feels that those kinds of revelations and those kinds of moments in our lives are the closest thing to God that he can think of. He He's a very dear friend, and he said, I encourage you to go further with that. Get weirder with that, I remember is what he said. So I've been trying to. You know, I've been trying to go further and get weirder with this knowledge that the people who disappeared from my life, there's a power that outlives them, that I, as someone who loves them and is loved by them, I'm able to do something with that. So I think that's what I'm trying to do. I love that you're continuing to carry their essence forth by doing that. So often I think when people are taken from us, however they are taken, sometimes we don't talk about them or express what was so much a part of them for fear of bumming other people out. Mm -hmm. As you are kind of saying earlier about protecting other people who are hearing this story, I love that you're feeling within your heart that you're carrying them with you, especially it sounds like when you're making art. I just would love to see more of that, of talking about people who aren't necessarily here with us anymore, because we keep them going when we're talking about them. I read a book years ago called Gypsy Dreams, Uh but this anthropologist is talking about the Romani death customs and among the French Manouche gypsies. Mm Mm-hmm. It's so fascinating about how there are certain cultural norms around how you talk about the dead. I wouldn't say my sister. I would say my dear sister, my dear, you know, forgot, my dear departed sister or my dear mother. Like I would talk about her with a certain respect. Yeah. And that would only come months after she was gone. It makes me think about how you don't want to bum people out. Like in our society, I feel like you don't want to be too spiritual or too like magical or whatever you want to call it. There's a respect and a reverence. And there's also things in that book around how their objects are treated. What you're saying in terms of appreciating how I talk about it and I think about it, it's something that I think we could all tap into and that I think we could tap into culturally as well. Roselle's research work regarding tech and screen time, informs his views on technology's influence on grief. After grad school, I was the only person on earth who didn't know what they were going to do next. And so I started writing to people whose work I had cited in my research. My research was essentially on how people can work together on a community level to create debt-free alternatives to higher, so-called higher learning. Mm -hmm. I ended up getting a job with someone working on a book about technology and screen time and things like that. I worked on that for a couple of years, helping them research that book. And through that, I got really interested in how technology is reshaping so many of the very fundamental things that make us human. 
I was toying around with the idea of researching my own book on the subject. And during that research, I just got really interested in looking at how technology is shaping our grieving processes. I think a lot of it came from the fact that I've always been drawn to grieving, not because I think it's like sexy or I think anything like that, but just because from a very early age, that's just how I made sense of the world yeah. was through needing to sublimate grief into something else. And so I was drawn to this idea of looking at how technology is reshaping grieving. And so I think what I was saying earlier, you know, in terms of like my conversations with my sisters, for example, I don't know that screen based push button messaging is the most soulful way for us to be having those conversations. I, I know that it's not. Right. You know, I need to just sit with them, even though they're far away and like have these conversations in person because that's what it deserves. Tell me more about how is technology affecting how we grieve? And this research that I was doing was on parenting in the digital age, parenting and technology. One of our sort of guidelines for thinking about this stuff is when you're looking at technology today, it's not enough to just take it as a given that everything technology is doing that's useful is a useful application of that technology. So in other words, if technology is doing something, is it replacing a different way of doing something that we were already doing? So if people say, well, technology is wonderful because we can put iPads in classrooms and they can, kids can read more books because we're giving them iPads and they have all these books already loaded onto the iPad. So this technology is good. That's not necessarily the case because you're not looking at the technology being good. You're looking at is the way that we're replacing the existing way of doing it a good application of that technology? So I could then argue, well, it's not necessarily good because what's going to happen to your school library? What's going to happen to your kids sense that there's a place where they go, like a library or a bookstore, and share ideas, you know, geek out on subjects with other people and things like that in a real face-to-face -face setting? That seems to me like a pretty good question to ask when you're thinking about technology, like, well, what is it replacing? And so in terms of grieving, you know, I remember a few years ago finding out that a very talented woman who I used to be in a relationship with, who I to this day love very much, had committed suicide. Mm. And I learned about that essentially on a bathroom break from lunch on my cell phone, looking at my cell phone screen. And I remember <sighs> just that deepening that trauma. I'll never forget that. So then in that case, you could say like, oh, well, no one had to break it to Roselle that this woman he loved very much killed herself. But that's not a good application. That's not a good replacement. Right. So I think in terms of that, we can ask ourselves, like if, if my friend passes away, I would rather one friend come to my house, knock on my door, say, let's go get coffee, give me a hug, go for a walk with me, ask me if I'm okay, then 50 people give a thumbs up to my announcement that my friend died or say, like, my condolences, right. rainbow emoji, right? you know? Right. And so I just think a direct answer to your question and more a statement of preference than anything else, but I just think it's making us less human around these things. It's making us more like cyborgs <laughs> and less like people who have feelings and emotions and ups and downs. Yeah, yeah. I personally have a really difficult time communicating on social media about very personal things, especially if I have somebody's phone number in my phone, I'm going to text them or call them rather than type something onto their Facebook page. And again, that's a personal choice, and I don't mean to judge. It's something that I just personally don't feel right about when it's something like that. I'm also wondering about how technology, like, I think our attention spans are getting so shortened. I mean, we are just looking for such bite-sized messaging. And so to take the time out to actually have a conversation with someone, I mean, to me, it's like gold, you know, to find that time with someone. We're just so friggin' busy. It's not just our culture. Our humanity 
has shifted dramatically due to technology. I think there's a lot tied up into it, you know? Like, I think about how humor is tied up into it as well. I think about irony. How? Um, I'm curious. Our sense of humor collectively, like, what is deemed good humor? I think right now, like, irony is humor. And humor is irony right now Uh in terms of what people look for. I was in a cafe the other day, and I heard somebody at the next table say, I literally lulled. (laughs) So they laughed. Yeah. Is what they did. Yeah. But in terms of their explanation, they literally lulled. So I think what I'm getting at is sincerity versus irony. Mm. And I think people right now in this culture, in this moment, are way more comfortable with irony than sincerity. Mm. Or not even that they're necessarily comfortable with it, but I it seems like irony is becoming our default for a lot of people. I think that irony is sort of a distancing strategy. So I think, yeah, technology, I think technology is feeding that. Mm -hmm. I think technology makes it easier for us to be more ironic, maybe a little less sincere. You know, people throw around, I think it's attributed to Orwell that in times of tyranny or something like honesty is the act of revolution, something very much paraphrasing right there. But I think it's kind of like that in times where everyone's just being ironic and sarcastic. Please give me a little bit of soulfulness. Give me some sincerity. I'm curious about something you said earlier. Tell me about the ways you sublimate your grief. Mm -hmm. I think when I was a kid, I figured out that I had to do that. Mm -hmm. My sister disappeared five years after my mother. So I was five when my mother disappeared. And I want to say that I had just turned 11 when my, my sister disappeared. So about five years. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if everything had been pushed back five years, if my mother had disappeared when I was 10 and my sister had disappeared when I was 15. I'm really fascinated by how people learn. And I was reading this thing by this guy who researches how people learn. He was talking about language learning and and kids. I don't think about the word grief all that much, but I think it's something that's always there. The language that I was really good at learning at five was like grief and survival, you know, very much in tandem with each other. I guess what I'm saying is that I sometimes think if my mother had disappeared when I was 10, I might not have had the same ability to learn this language of just needing to deal with it. So in a lot of ways, it feels second nature, sublimating grief. I think just knowing the word sublimating is a big deal. Sometimes I think about how the words that we have or don't have at our disposal shape our reality. So I think that's an important word for a lot of people to know. You know, like, I don't know the textbook definition, but for me, sublimating is like making something sublime. And that's usually something that wasn't sublime to begin with. You know, something, a sort of alchemy. Yeah. I think knowing the word has been helpful. I can probably thank some high school English teacher for that or middle school teacher for that. But then also just like, I use this word a lot, but just like being prepared to have soulful conversations with my friends about it has been really important because like I told you about my friend earlier who said that he got chills hearing about this idea that my mom had passed her powers on to me. I think that that's been a huge way is just allowing myself to have soulful conversations. And I think that we all have our challenges to doing that. And I'm not judging anyone for not having soulful conversations or saying that I'm having more soulful conversations than anyone. But I think that's been huge. And then making art, doing, you know, doing creative stuff. I mentioned my sister loving music. I remember one time, this was in the age of cassette tapes. And she and I, we had this idea that we were going to buy cassette tapes And once we had enough cassette tapes, we were going to rent out an apartment and we were going to turn an apartment into a nightclub. And I don't know how many cassette tapes we thought we were going to need, but that was our idea. I remember I had Push It by Salt and Peppa and we had a few other tapes, but that was our idea was that we were going to like. And so like, I think even with music, because I love music, drawing is my way of connecting with my mother. And I think that music has been a big part in big part because of my sister and her love for music. I started playing music really shortly after she disappeared. What do you play? Well, then I played upright bass. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I started playing upright bass when I was a little kid. The story about how I started playing upright bass is kind of funny. They came to our school, they being the music teachers from the middle school, 
to show us fifth graders what instruments we could choose from. Yeah. And my father had already given me permission to play an instrument, but he hadn't told me which one. And I was a latchkey kid, which meant that after school every day, I walked home by myself, let yeah. myself in, et cetera. And I remember looking at the big upright bass, and they had told us that we had to take our instruments home on the weekend. <laughs> and I remember looking at that upright bass and thinking, oh, if I pick that instrument, my dad's going to have to pick me <laughs> ah, up, awesome. at least on Fridays. And so I started playing upright bass. But I really do think that that, in terms of what I do to sublimate, is having found and attached my energies and my passions to creative things early on. And I really think that it's all been part of paying respect and keeping my connection to these two wonderful women who disappeared early on in my life. When we had spoken before, you had said that your art channels your mother's positivity. It's true in a lot of ways. It's true because when I say that my art is about my mom, that doesn't mean that I'm filling my bedroom with portraits of my mother. Yeah. I do have the one self-portrait that she did, and that's like my most valued object. Oh. Honestly, it's the only object in the world that I care about. It's about my mom because it's, I feel like in a way she is making it just as much as I'm making it. I remember listening to this talk by Thich Nhat Hanh a few years ago, and he's talking about how if you want to touch your mother's hand, touch your own hand because your mother's hand is also there. And I think about that when I'm making art in a very real way. And my art is generally pretty joyous, just kind of wild and weird and so in a way, that's very much her having a positive impact on my art making and her being very present as a positive force in my art making. Just this morning, I was talking with somebody. It came up that I'm an artist. And how do I buy your art? How do I look at your art? And I said, well, like, I don't put my art on the internet, really, because I just, I just don't. And it was funny. He said, well, these days you have to put your art on the internet. And I said, no, I don't, <laughs> Be, you know, not out of disrespect to him, but no, I don't. And that is very much my mentality about art making is that it's very much something that I get to do whatever I want with. Sometimes people ask me if I make art for a living and I tell them, well, I can't live without it. So I guess I do make it for a living. <laughs> That's something that I'm coming to terms with in a different way now. But it means that for several decades now, I've been making art just because it has a deep spiritual meaning to me. And that's not something that a lot of people allow themselves to do. And I think that I've allowed myself to do that because of that connection and that communion with my mother. It's beautiful. You have a really beautiful first name. And I had looked at the notice of your mother's disappearance. And I saw that your name is your mother's maiden name. Yeah. Were you given that name at birth or did you adopt that name for yourself? I was given her maiden name as my middle name. Okay. And I, at one point, I want to say in my 20s, I realized that it was beautiful that I had her name in my name. Yeah. And so that just became my preferred name first for music making purposes. And then I just loved it so much and decided to, you know, it's like a little, it's a built in reminder every day I get to hear her name, which is nice. Like every time people address me. So it's, getting to keep her with me in a way that I can hear, too. Grief, Gratitude, and Greatness is a production of Recursive Delete Audiovisual in Portland, Oregon. This episode was produced and edited by Jack Saturn and me, Sarah Shaul. The music was by Samantha Jensen. Visit us online at griefgratitudegreatness.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at Grief Gratitude Great. Subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you like to listen. And leave us a review. Your feedback helps our show and helps us find new listeners. If you have a story of your own that you'd like to share or topics you'd like to hear more about, we'd love to hear from you. Call or text our show at 503 454 6646 or send us a message via the contact link at griefgratitudegreatness.com Be sure to let your friends know about us and join us next time. We look forward to sharing more conversations with you.